For our first ISNAF story of 2024, we are with Professor Paola Arlotta, Professor of Stem Cell and Regenerative Biology and Department Chair at Harvard University. Benvenuta Paola and uh, grazie for your ISNAF story. Thank you. You work on a revolutionary technique to study the brain and its diseases, brain organoids. I heard you saying that you make human brain. So do tell us about it. What an introduction. <laughs> What's your job? I make human brain. I don't make human brain, but I um, develop a technology together with a lot of colleagues, of course, in the field that allows us to take this today, a sample of blood or of skin from any one of us, any 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 human being, and be able to turn that blood into a cell called a stem cell. And then um, through a lot of work that uh, relies on signals that we know from how normally the brain is formed, um, we coach that stem cell to begin a process of formation of a specific uh, part of the brain. Now, um, this takes a long time in culture, much like it takes a long time, as you know, for our own brain to be made when we develop in the womb and then when we're born and, and go through life, it takes a long time for these organoids to be made. At the end of the day, what we obtain is a, a, a very small piece of tissue about the size of an apple seed um, that um, looks quite insignificant, but if you look inside of it, you see that there are cells that are normally found in the human brains. There are connections among those cells that form circuits that are normally found in the human brain. And it's not exactly like the human brain. That's why it's called human brain organoid. It's not an organ, it's a copy of an organ. It's much more simple, but uh, it's extremely powerful for, for, you know, in a way, obvious reasons, we can't quite study the human brain. I can't ask you to give me a little sample of your brain, can't I? Like I could ask you to give me a sample of your blood. Um, and therefore, we know very little about how our brain is formed. Nobody has ever watched that process at the resolution, looking at all cells and all connections that we can within these organoids. And so it's a whole new world of understanding how the human brain is made and what makes us, you know, unique in its function. And, and what can you tell us about your research on using organoids to study disorders such as yeah. autism, schizophrenia, bipolar disorders Absolutely. and others? That's the main motivation for going after this. Well, there are really two motivations. The first is what I just mentioned to you, that we know as scientists very little about our own brain. We're obsessed about it because it is the organ one can argue that defines us, and yet we know very little about it. Or everything that we know about it, most of what we know about it comes from studying other species that don't have the same brain as we do. Uh, and so there is a real motivation in uh, trying to access and study and understand processes of formation and development of the human brain that otherwise we could never ever study because it all happens, mostly happens in utero. That's number one. And the second is because um, some of the most devastating diseases of our time, and I'm thinking about the psychiatric diseases, think about schizophrenia, think about neurodevelopmental diseases, neurodevelopmental, so they started during development of the brain, like autism spectrum disorder. We know very little about this pathology, and yet they affect some of the you know, fundamentally human <laughs> characteristics. These are diseases that are almost uh, impossible or they're very, very difficult. And I can explain why um, to study in other species like mice that normally are used in, uh, uh, in the lab. And um, that really require fresh new understanding for developing new therapies for these conditions. So why do we want to make the human brain in the lab in order to study the brain and most importantly, in order to understand the origin of complex pathologies like schizophrenia or autism spectrum disorder. Um, but fundamentally, 
um, we will never have access to a really deep uh, understanding of how the human brain is made because most of its development occurs when we are uh, embryos and then you know babies in utero and over an extended period of time during infancy and childhood and so on and so forth. And uh, as it should be, we don't have access to this tissue and we will never have access to it in an experimental manner, right? Like we can't, of course, <laughs> um, look at the developing human brain in its normal setting, which is an embryo in utero. And therefore, we know almost nothing about how this beautiful organ comes to be. The second um, reason why we, um, you know, we want to, to make these models of the brain, these brain organoids, is because for, the, uh, for these diseases like schizophrenia and autism spectrum disorder, we have a lot of questions about what cell types in the brains are affected in these diseases, when do they get affected, what goes wrong during development of the brain in the brain of a child that is later diagnosed with autism, it may surprise you, but nobody really knows. And this is very different from other diseases like neurodegenerative diseases, like let's say Parkinson's disease. We have a lot of knowledge about what cell types die in this disease, for example, but that's not the case for schizophrenia and autism. What we have for these pathologies is genetic information. So work done by many, many labs over the past 10 years or so have come up with genetic information about what could be the genetic underpinning of these pathologies. And when they looked at it, they saw something pretty complex. These are not diseases caused by mutation in one gene or two genes that one could sort of study in a mouse. These are diseases where many, many positions in the human genome sometimes not even within genes that code for proteins, sometimes and most times inside regions that just are regulatory, they don't produce a protein. Many of these collectively provide a certain likelihood that an individual will develop a disease. So if you have genetics of schizophrenia, that is genetic of the human genome, what you need inside a cell to understand what the genetic does is the human genome. And there is no other way to have the human genome in a cell unless the cell is human, because <laughs> mice happen to have mice, mouse genomes. So when we make this brain organoid from a sample of blood that comes from you, let's say, <laughs> the cells that we make and that are present inside the organoids, all of the cells carry your own genome. And, and if that genome is that of a patient with schizophrenia or autism spectrum disorder, for the very first time, we can actually ask what that genetic situation does to the cells that compose the brain and to the function of the brain. So that's where perhaps the opportunity to really understand how a genetic state associated with risk of disease causes disease comes from in a lab. And uh, how far are, are we to develop a cure for these disorders? It, it's very hard to make predictions on these kind of things. And especially when the disease in question is so complex as, as complex as schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. And especially when the tissue that we're really studying is the human brain. This said, if you look at the history of development of these drugs, it has been almost like a history based on luck, meaning occasionally some drugs that were developed oftentimes for other reasons may have had an impact or an effect, a beneficial effect on a patient. Um, this said, the development of therapeutics for these diseases based on understanding of really what the disease is, what cells are affected, what processes are affected, biological understanding of what's going on inside the brain of a patient, uh, that has been basically impossible because mice and other experimental models in lab cannot tell you the full picture. They're very important even to study these diseases, but they cannot give you the full picture for the reason we mentioned related to the unique genetics of this pathology and the unique complexity of this pathology. So the idea here is it's a new path. It's a new set of tools that we can use 
to um, see if we can understand where the human disease starts, what it's caused by, to then develop informed therapeutics. That's what I always think about. Development of, of therapeutics that is based on something we know about the human brain and the human disease. And so from that point of view, I think that this technology will allow the field to make a leap forward. You know, sometimes we talk about progress in science and usually progress works at a certain speed that tends to be constant in time. I don't think that's one of those cases. Here, because of these amazing technologies and other related to them, we're gonna make a leap. Now, where do we go with this leap is a different story, but we're not gonna move at the speed that science has moved in this field up to now. And, and that's how I, I see it. It's an opportunity to do something very different. And um, is there anything you are particularly worried about instead regarding possible future directions in this field? Yeah. So how should we think about science, this kind of science, especially in ethical space? And this is in particular a type of science or a field that does require scientists to think about their experiment and their work and what they want to do and where they want to go in the future in a specific ethical framework. And why is that? Well, you we started this interview with you telling me or asking me whether I make <laughs> human brain. And it's something that shocks you, right? Because the human brain, I mean, our brain is what defines us um, as, as individuals and as members of the species. And it's not the same as saying I make liver. If I had say I made the liver, <laughs> you would not have been as shocked, right? So, so we need to think about why we do this kind of work. The reasons are multiple. We mentioned something earlier about really a new way of thinking about understanding the human brain and also understanding how it is affected by disease. And that's very important because I think that it's also in the realm of unethical not to go down a certain road in science if you think that it could be beneficial to patients that don't have therapies, effective therapies at the moment. But also we need to think about what we're doing. And so in this case, we are making a, a tiny, tiny reductionist, meaning that it's not exactly like the, like the brain, but it can be a model of the human brain with a lot of features. It's got the cell types that should be present within a certain brain region. The neurons that we form can mature up to a point, it's still a very young tissue. Um, they connect with each other, make synapses and circuit. I could show you a little movie that shows that this circuit sort of uh, fire, which is much of what happens in our brain. But all of the things that are mentioned thus far are not that new in science. So scientists have been making human neurons from stem cells, no big deal. Scientists have seen that these neurons can form synapses and fire action potential, still no big deal. What is the big deal here is that you're really building a system and it's not just one cell type or another of the brain, it's many of the cells that should be there and many of these communications among cells that should be there. And um, we started simple by making tissue that could grow and develop for a short period of time. And in a relatively short time, years, but um, the organ became more and more complex because scientists began to understand what to do to make them develop more. So the real question is, where are we today and should we be worried? It's very early days and I'm not worried. And like me, many of my fellow scientists are not worried. In fact, not just my fellow scientists, but the wonderful colleagues in bioethics, philosophers, lawyers, politicians, and members of society with whom we have had many, many conversations and religious scholars, I should say, across all religions or many of the main religions with which we have had long, long conversations about the science. Now, should we stop having this conversation because we're not worried today? Absolutely not. This is science that needs to be revised with time because progress happens. Uh, and so I expect to continue this type of conversation and be ready to stop the moment we think that we should stop. It's not time to do so right now because 
in reality, what these organoids are, it's not problematic. Um, I don't believe that is anything to do with conscience or sentience or anything like that at this time. But we need to do this work in the right ethical framework. And so these conversations have to continue. Stopping now, I think, would be unethical relative to the patients. Uh, I read some of your um, uh, very interesting thoughts about innovation and in that context uh, about philanthro uh, philanthropic funding. Here's what I think. <laughs> I think that sometime progress, uh, it's not hampered necessarily by lack of ideas or by lack of talented scientists uh, that have big ideas and the guts to uh, ask big questions and take personal risks and uh, uh, both in their career, but sometimes even personally for science that is controversial, right? Um, and uh, could do the experiment and really move the field forward. That's just one part of it. The second part equally important is commitment from society to fund this work. It's really expensive work, especially the one of stem cell derived human brain organoids. I never find that we are hampered by lack of ideas. It's always a matter of money at some at some point, even in places where there is funding and there is a support for this kind of science. So philanthropy comes seen in a very powerful, very meaningful way because partnership with individuals or or you know entities who are able to commit financial support to science, trusting the scientist and uh, um, believing in bold visions. That's a partnership that really can make the field move. And, and so I have been very lucky at times to have this kind of um, relationship with um, donors who uh, really believed in the science and wanted to see it uh, move forward their work is equally important <laughs> or of equal impact as our work physically in the lab. If you don't put the two together, you're just going to do conventional science that can be funded by more traditional uh, mechanisms, which is extremely important and very valid. But you also need to make the leap of faith and try stuff that has a high risk of failure for the sake of perhaps really moving the field that can only be done with financial support that has no strings attached. You, you are part of the initiative on women in science and engineering, and uh, you wrote an article titled Seven Actionable Strategies for Advancing Women in Science. Yeah. Uh, so please tell us about it also in the context of your experience as a woman in science. Yes, um, that was beautiful work that we did um, several years ago together with the New York Stem Cell Foundation. I was one member of this larger group of men and women who uh, began to put their heads together to think about practical things that one can do to make sure that the world of science becomes more balanced and diverse. I think that diversity is important, not per se, but because really... Uh, having dif diversity of opinion, um, diversity of upbringing, um, diversity of experiences in life is very important for generating diversity of ideas. So here's my, uh, my view. I think about scientists, just a scientist. I don't like to tag people, men, women, or, you know, from this background or this other background. Um, but I firmly believe that there are many, many different ways to be successful in science. And if we impose just one way, just one model, just one path, it is very likely not to enable everybody to fulfill their potential. And it took me as a person a very long time to accept the fact that I kind of knew what was working for me and what wasn't, but I was still following a, predispo a predefined path to success. That, for example, oftentimes required meetings very early in the morning, pretty much at the time when I wanted to be instead be home and have breakfast with my kids and take them to school. 
which was important for me. And it's important for many women, but also for many men. It's a silly example that I'm giving you, but there are so many practical things that can be adjusted to enable a broader group of people to feel like, oh, I can do this. It's tough. It requires a lot of time and effort and energy and talent, but there is a way, a path for me to succeed. And it's my own path. So I, what I always tell people is be you and be brave and be you because it's not so easy when everybody around you works in a different way. What was your professional journey from growing up in Italy to being a professor at Harvard? Oh, my goodness. Certainly was not a planned journey. <laughs> I was pretty knowledgeable pretty early on that I loved science. I was very curious about a lot of things that happen in nature. I uh, grew up in an environment, in a really loving family who put a lot of effort in making us, um, me, my brother, um, be happy. This do what you like uh, was very important for me because as I was very aware that I liked science, I really could not see very clearly a path forward for me in science. I frankly wasn't sure I would have had a job I liked. I wasn't so sure what I would have done with a degree in biology. And uh, I didn't have really anybody at that time who could tell me exactly where this could go. Certainly nobody told me, oh, you could become a professor in a major institution and do the work that you love the research work that you love. I didn't have that. Eventually, you sort of imagine it, but it requires a lot of imagination if you don't have role models that have done this next to you. And so, and then I got lucky. And the luck came when the Teleton Foundation gave me a fellowship to go uh, experience research for a couple of years abroad. And from that, I could really... Um, experience a world of research that I really, really liked. I made connection with important role models that advised me on the fact that I needed to get a PhD and, um, and continue my path in science. They also continue to tell me, do what you like. Um, but I learned a lot of things and I owe it to a lot of mentors. So I will say the journey was influenced by an upbringing that favored playing and dreaming and then foster curiosity as a good thing and the love for what you do. And then through mentorship of professors and colleagues, and there is one person in particular that I would like to mention, unfortunately passed a, a few years ago. This was my science professor in Italy. I did the Liceo Scientifico in Gorizia. And what this professor did to a bunch of students, a class of students, you know, three fourths of which couldn't care less about science. He took us into a makeshift lab that he had in the science room to plate bacteria and look at the growth of organisms and, uh, and write essays on it. And I just couldn't get enough of it. <laughs> so it's thanks to this professor, Antonio Vecchia, who sort of inspired me early on. And I hope I can do the same with my students uh, right now. Although I feel that compared to me, they need much less inspiration. They know what they want to do. <laughs> the power of good teachers is, is amazing. I think so, yeah. yeah. Do you have professional ties with Italy? So Yes and no. I do have lots of ties with um, um, colleagues and collaborators that, you know, here and there we do work together. And I'm on scientific advisory boards for um, some entities in, in Italy, which I think is very, very important. I review for some of the, you know, um, grant opportunities for Italian scientists and beyond, as well as European um, sort of uh, funding opportunities, of course. Uh, that would affect Italy. Um, but I will say that at this moment, I haven't quite engaged with Italy and the Italian scientific community the way I would like to. Um, I think there is a lot in, you know, at the, at the end of the day, I'm Italian. I feel I'm an Italian scientist. 
who had this incredible opportunity to be here and you know do her work. Um, but I have enormous respect for the work that is done in Italy. And um, I must say, sometimes, uh, despite the funding situation, you know, it's easy to do well when when you kind of um, can fund any experiments that your mind can think of. And it's a completely different story when resources are more scarce. So um, I think that there is incredible um, opportunity in Italy. Uh, I think I've said it before, uh, but one thing that strikes me at this point, I've had the privilege of, of interacting with students that got trained in many different systems, both in other universities in Europe, as well as in Italy, as well as here. And some of the students are incredible. I think that the kind of education that we get at university in Italy is outstanding. I don't have really another word to describe it. We are so prepared for what research throws at us and so primed for an amazing impact in the world of science. So there is a little bit of disconnect between that potential and that investment and, and sort of the creativity of the, of the general population in, in science and the investment that is made in research. And I would love to see that change because I think that there is a lot of interest to make it change, um, both uh, you know in, in in political in the political space um, as well as you know in in science space. And only then I think the real potential will come out and the real, real power of the Italian scientists. And I would love to be part of that. Yeah. I saw in a video of a talk you gave the pictures of your children. Uh, that was in the context of teenager brains, actually. But I'd like to ask you instead about their relationship with Italy. Do they speak Italian? Do they uh, do they feel at home there? Um, so my daughter in particular, my, my eld uh, oldest, she uh, went to Italy every summer of her childhood. Um, and first with us and then staying with the grandparents uh, for several reasons. One, because I really wanted her to really know her grandparents. It was very important to me and my husband, but also because I wanted her to know Italy. That, um, you know, there is so much that you can give her at home, but it's only if they go to Italy, they really understand what life is and what it can be and how beautiful it is. And, and so she not only speaks Italian, um, I may say without an English accent, which is not uh, so trivial. So people, Italian people who speak to her sometimes wonder if she grew up in Italy, um, but also appreciates completely the Italian culture. And in her own word, she's 50-50. And now considering perhaps even living in Europe after she finished school. So. Uh, my son, the second, you know, the second child, you tend to have a harder time always speaking in Italian. And he, for a variety of personal reasons, couldn't go to Italy every summer. But uh, he still understands and speaks Italian. He's taking Italian in high school right now. And uh, um, I would say maybe it's not 50-50, maybe 70 American, 30 Italian. Um, so I think we they they grew up really in a world in between, hopefully um, catching the beauty of both. Is there is there anything that we didn't cover that you'd like to add? What would be the advice from somebody like me who left Italy, came to the United States, and then stayed? What would be the advice to young people who wants to who want to be in science and uh, are have to make important decisions? I think at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter if one goes abroad or stays in Italy, as long as you figure out whether that is the environment that will foster your growth and fulfill your potential the way you are imagining it. Because there are advantages and disadvantages to both a situation, staying in Italy and living there growing up there in science and in your personal life, or going away and being abroad where uh, perhaps in some cases, but not in all, it might be 
an advantage from a scientific viewpoint, but it's a huge personal cost, at least initially um, for you as a person. Um, as of today, I feel I'm lucky. I was lucky. I came into a beautiful city, an amazing community of scientists. Uh, there are more accents than one can count in Boston. And so I never felt one day as a foreigner here, but it was not Italy. Would I have liked to be in Italy instead? There were times when I thought about it. Now I feel I'm happy here. I've been here for so many years, but not every situation is like mine. So it's, it's, an, it's a heavy decision. The other is that when we leave, and this is more perhaps for um, um, colleagues in leadership uh, who have to make decisions about how to retain youth and uh, foster growth in the country, is that when people leave Italy to go do research abroad at age 25, 26, and sometimes at age 30, the chances or the likelihood that they'll come back are very, very, very small. That's the time when we establish our life as, as adults. You're going to meet someone. You're going to have uh, children in a new place. You're going to have successes. Uh, it's hard to come back. It's not the same as coming here younger or much older. So that's something to consider. It's almost always what happened to me, which I, I thought I was going abroad for two years. And before leaving, I had claimed that I would stay one year. <laughs> and that was 1996. So we need to think about that too. It's grazie mille, Paola. It was very inspiring, very interesting. Prego, grazie, grazie a voi per l'opportunità di parlare, di farci questa chiacchierata. E buona giornata. Grazie.